This is the 150th um, anniversary celebration interview with Professor Maria Zuber. And um, I, if you don't mind, I, I just got a hold of the Zuber report <laughs> because of the announcement from the provost yesterday. So I, I was going to ask you about that first, and then we can go back and kind of proceed. Is that okay with you? That's, a, that's okay. okay. All right. Um, so uh, can you give me a summary of what would the recommendations in the report? Okay, so the, the Zuber report was um, commissioned by uh, the provost and the chancellor to consider environmental activities at MIT. And um, so MIT has gained a lot of notoriety recently as, uh, as a leader in energy, um, but it seems not to be at the tip of everyone's tongue when you raise the term of the environment. And so uh, I was asked to uh, work with a group and, um, and to try to understand what we really have going on in terms of uh, uh, the environment and, um, and where it could go. And um, so we, uh, we had representation um, on the group from all parts of the institute. We had students who were fantastic. Uh, we talked to uh, a lot of people, really, uh, as many people as we could in the time available. And, um, and what became apparent is that there is a great deal of interest in the environment uh, at MIT uh, from the standpoint of engineering, science, uh, social aspects, policy, um, but that it was like the let a thousand flowers grow. It was distributed all over the place. And, um, and so what we thought is that if, if we did nothing else other than to coalesce those activities into a handful of unifying concepts uh, that, um, that MIT's visibility in this area would grow because all of the individual uh, research efforts um, that we saw were, um, were really of the highest possible quality. Okay. And, um, and so we suggested some ideas uh, in the report. We talked to students about how the environment, um, their access to environmental courses um, in the curriculum, and, um, and they, uh, uh, there, there wasn't a single place where you could go to try to understand what environmental um, courses there were. But our students are, um, uh, they're very savvy. And so they managed to somehow navigate their way through the system, um, no matter how the information is set up. But it, it certainly um, would take uh, individuals who, who had some uh, um, desire to go into that area to really dig. And um, so we, uh, we suggested um, some concepts uh, for future study. Um, and, uh, and we suggested that, uh, that the Institute in particular um, looked at the idea of sustainability. Um, and, uh, and the interesting thing about sustainability in the environment is that uh, when you talk to different people, you get lots of different definitions about what sustainability is. And no one really, like we talk to people in science, and they would say, sustainability, well, that's engineering. You know? and, uh, um, uh, but sustainability was something that overwhelmingly the students wanted to, um, to learn more about. So we started a dialogue um, about uh, what we saw sustainability to be and where it should go. And, um, and, uh, and it was interesting because the, the group of people that was put together on the committee came from all over the institute. And, um, uh, and, and several of them, um, they felt a little bit unloved because of all the attention going um, with energy. And, uh, and, at, and, and so I, I really, uh, I was a little bit concerned about whether we could really get a report together that, um, that uh, the whole group would buy into. Um, but actually, by the, uh, the end of the process, um, everybody was so excited uh, about the possibilities that existed for taking this idea forward um, that the entire committee 
uh, asked me if they could all sign the transmittal letter to the provost and chancellor to underscore um, the depth of their support for, um, for moving forward on this. Uh, the provost almost fainted when he saw the, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the letter, um, and, uh, but it was great. And so, um, so then there's been now, uh, there's follow-on work uh, going on now by an environmental research council, which we suggested be convened. And they're now getting into the implementation stage. Um, and in fact, uh, today, the day that we're filming, I spent uh, the earlier part of the day on a campus-wide symposium on rethinking water. Okay, And water was one of the ideas that we came up with um, that was critical to the environment. It was extremely important. It was a, you know, a unifying um, principle. And, um, and, uh, and something that I think uh, there, we have a lot of work going on already now in, in water, but uh, certainly by holding a symposium and getting people's ideas on the table, um, already there are ideas emerging for taking this forward. So, so you, you mentioned in your report um, a sort of description of programs at Michigan and Berkeley and Princeton and other places. Um, can you articulate what it is that MIT offers that would be kind of new and different in this area? Well, some of, the, some of these other schools, um, so these are, all, these are all great schools and they all have, uh, they all have great programs. And, um, and uh, what we were able to divine from um, investigating the situation is that in some cases uh, these programs had greater visibility because they had a school of the environment, okay, um, or a, a center for the environment. So um, it, it was essentially a location and a group of people who were coalesced in the same place. And in some cases, uh, the level of effort of what was going on was actually substantially less than what MIT was doing, but it was just the way that it was um, nucleated. So, um, so I think what MIT brings to this is that we have such depth in so many different areas. Um, you know, we're, you know, obviously we're number one in every aspect of engineering, um, you know, and in science and our social sciences and our humanities and the business and the economics, um, the political science, you know, all of these things we have just exceptional depth in. Um, and I think, you know, compared to anybody else, you know, we're, we're strong in every area, okay? And, um, and so when we get people together, uh, we don't lack anything that the problem needs. So um, this is, you know, the study of the environment, it's a complex system. And, uh, and not only is the interplay in different parts of the environment systems complex, but trying to figure out what to do about it because it requires uh, attitudes and behaviors of people to have to change um, in order to do it. So it, it becomes a, a sociology and a psychology problem as well as a science and engineering problem. And, um, and because we're so strong in all of those areas, um, uh, I think that we can really um, go after those uh, problems. I, uh, another thing that I, I think we bring to the problem is, uh, is just that there's an attitude on this campus in, in anything that we do uh, that nothing is impossible. Okay? They're, they're, you know, I think it's being in a, a school that, uh, the, that is grounded so strongly in engineering that um, in engineering, you have to find a solution. I mean, there, there isn't a problem where you don't find a solution. You have to figure out how to do something. And, um, and so rather than park a problem in the corner because you say that's too complicated to really go after, um, uh, it's instead, okay, well, let's take this problem and we can't, we can't know everything about the problem, but let's pick a part of it that, uh, that we can get our arms around and make progress. And, um, and so, um, uh, you know, it, I mean, it's great to be in a place where 
you, you can't really be scared away from something just because it's a big challenge. In fact, uh, around here, those kinds of problems tend to attract people. And you move on now to this um, Senior Energy and Environmental Board at MIT. Do you, do you know what the nature of your work in that's going to be? Okay, so the Senior Energy and Environmental Board um, is a group of people, all of whom have, I think, some administrative responsibility here at the Institute um, that, uh, advise, that, that is uh, going to advise the provost on um, uh, the environment as an uh, initiative as it moves forward. And, and uh, I think really the idea of it is, is to um, assure that there is a synergy between the energy initiative and the environment initiative. So, um, so when President Hockfield gave her inauguration speech, she actually mentioned energy and the environment in the speech. And, um, and so initially the energy part of it took off. Um, and I think the environment part is now catching up. So although, I actually I have to give uh, uh, Ernie Moniz and Bob Armstrong credit um, in the energy initiative because they actually uh, were incorporating uh, environmental aspects uh, into the energy initiative uh, from the beginning, mostly related to climate issues and uh, climate mitigation. Um, uh, but, um, but as we move ahead, uh, it's, it's important to make sure that um, that, that the two activities are um, synergizing in places where it makes sense to synergize, um, and uh, or at least uh, not acting totally independently. So of course there are parts of um, environmental studies that don't directly relate to the energy initiative, and those are interesting things to study in their own right, and they ought to be studied. Um, but in places where it makes sense to synergize, um, we ought to synergize. Okay, and so, so an example of that would be um, when we talk about introducing new energy sources into the stream, um, you know, we can come up for all, with all these ideas uh, and many ideas are being put forth, uh, but, you know, for goodness sake, you don't want to create a bigger problem than you actually have. So, um, so for example, if you talk about wind, you put up windmills and they change the wind stress at the surface of the earth and how does that affect the microclimate in an area, okay? Um, uh, you know, when we talk about putting out solar panels and, and of course, you know, we're talking here ab at about doing things at a scale where they actually help energy, okay? So if we just do things at a very small scale uh, so that you can charge your cell phone at home or something, it's, that's fine, but it doesn't really help the world's uh, energy needs. We actually have to think about uh, scaling things up to the point where um, they really make an impact. Um, so if we think about putting out lots of solar cells to collect solar energy and convert that to electricity, well, um, it changes the albedo of the Earth, which changes how much solar energy is absorbed, which uh, since they're dark, actually has the potential to heat up the earth, and that might not be a good idea. And, um, and so it's very important when we think about these things, uh, when we think about energy sources, that we also think about um, the environmental impacts. Um, we also, um, you know, I think we also, uh, you know, need to think about, you know, more broadly, uh, green engineering. You know, when we when we think about engineering um, new parts, new devices, uh, and we train our students um, uh, in the fundamentals of uh, of engineering design, um, I mean, it just it just seemed to a lot of us that uh, environmental consciousness ought to be a part of the design process. Now, um, you know, green this, green that, it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a very popular word right now that gets used. Um, and, um, and if you can do it 
that's good, and there's all sorts of good reasons to do it. The question is, can you afford to do it? Um, you know, is it feasible to do in a cost-effective way that that a product can be sold, um, and it can be sold, at, you know, with a design that has the right quality that um, that one needs, and um, and so so it seems like there's a lot of potential to infuse that into our engineering programs. So um, so in this. Uh, Board will be looking for those synergies and looking for places where we can, um, you know, assess ideas that are uh, coming up and maybe pop a few back um, uh, on our own as well. You sound excited. Well, uh, yeah, I I am, and and I, um, I have to say, um, you know, in the in my office, my department head's office, uh, I have, you know, I. I Keep putting out magazines that I get in the the grocery store about you know about climate change about uh, environmental change um, about energy and um, and you know I talk to my faculty I'll go in and I'll show them and they'll say Maria you're preaching to the choir and I says no I got this at the grocery store we're relevant <laughs> this is this is our moment here. Um, uh, you know, people tend to listen to us a lot anyway because we're from MIT. Um, but this is this is uh, a time and a place and um, problems that have huge societal interest, not only just to a subset of the population, but to the whole world. And um, and you know what a great privilege it is um, to be able to study these problems and to, to forge a path forward ourselves, um, but, but even more so um, to provide the training um, for the students that are coming through here, who are the people who are really uh, going to be inheriting um, this world and are going to have to solve these problems. So, uh, so training them in a way that they can uh, come up with the the scientific, the technical, the policy um, uh, questions, but also also educating people in a way that they can be uh, informed voters. I think uh, also on uh, on these matters. Um, well, thank you. Let me let me turn now to the sort of more chronological look. Okay. Um, can you tell me where you were born and where you grew up? Okay, so <clears throat> I, um, I was born in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Um, let's see, uh, the first few years I, uh, I lived, um, I guess, in suburban Philadelphia, uh, really adjacent to the campus of Ursinus College, which is a little private uh, college. Um, in the suburbs, and then um, my father was a state policeman, so we we moved uh, up closer to where uh, he and my mother had grown up, uh, and that was in uh, Summit Hill, Pennsylvania. And it's uh, it's a little coal town in um, central eastern Pennsylvania. It was the uh, I think the first place, at least in eastern Pennsylvania, where uh, anthracite coal was first discovered in the 1800s. So, um, so both of my grandfathers were coal miners. So. And you were the first person in your family to go to college, I understand. Uh, I was the first person to, um, to go to college. And, um, and in fact, um, you know, when I was in high school, my, uh, my father thought that I should, he thought it, I mean, he was really proud that I was going to be the first person in the family to go to college. And he, he thought I should go to um, the, uh, the set local satellite campus for Penn State that was, uh, you know, 15 miles away from the house. And, um, and uh, I applied for a senatorial scholarship uh, from school that the state of Pennsylvania has some of these scholarships, and the senator's office called my father and said, "She shouldn't be going to 
uh, satellite campus of Penn State. She, she ought to go to the Ivy League <laughs> and um, just have her, you know, apply to, um, you know, you know, a, a, you know, one of the Ivy League schools. And um, so I, I applied to um, the University of Pennsylvania um, because they had a program there for um, uh, students from uh, small towns in Pennsylvania. And um, and I, I got into Penn early, and then. Um, and then I didn't enter that program. I didn't want to go into that small communities program because I wanted to get away from people from small. I didn't want to be hanging out with other people. Uh, you know, the whole idea of going to a school like that that's uh, that's so diverse is to you know just see a whole different um, subsection of uh, of people. So um, so I didn't enter that program, but I went to Penn, and uh, that that was good. Um, I know that um, there's one um, experience from your childhood that really helped set you on the path that you were interested in, and it's it's around I think the moon landing. Uh, well, it, it's um, you know that uh, yeah that influenced me a great deal. So, um, but uh, but I was. Uh, that was defining, but I was hooked before then. So, um, how did you get hooked? Uh, you, you know, I. Uh, it's uh, it, I'm positive that it's uh, it was genetically encoded um, into me. I mean, I knew I was reading books about space from the time I could read, uh, and um, and actually, my mother tells stories about. Uh, when they were doing the first rocket launches on TV, and I was in my playpen, that I would just be jumping up and down and pointing to, uh, and not just the launch, but the, you know, just sitting there, mission control, and I'd be jumping up and down and pointing, and um, and so um, yeah, I started. Uh, I, I read everything in sight, and I started um, actually building telescopes when I was seven or eight, and. Um, and the moon landing was when I was ten. So, uh, so, and my parents let me stay up late to watch the uh, the first uh, to, to see Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And um, uh, well, I, I, you know, I knew that uh, that was what I wanted to do. And and I never, never, ever, for a moment, deviated from that. Um, and I did it. You know, I said I was going to do it, and I didn't. I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I, I wanted to study space. Yeah. How, when you got to Penn, how did you determine that that combination of geology and astrophysics was the right mix? Oh, oh well, it was. Um, so I, um, yeah, I majored in astronomy and astrophysics, and uh, and it was <clears throat> actually it was really. Uh, it only happened because uh, I finished m my major like a year early, and um, I got through all my coursework, and then I took an engineering class. I thought about, um, I was thinking about graduate school, and I uh, was trying to decide between um, astronomy, astrophysics, engineering, and then I took, I took geophysics, because uh, it had physics in it. I says, that's good, physics. I like physics, so I'll take geophysics. And, um, and then I realized that I had so many basic science courses uh, uh, that I could actually get a geology major in a year, because uh, I had taken so many courses. So, um, so I just uh, picked that up um, the last year. And um, and then when I applied to graduate school, I I, I applied to astronomy departments, uh, engineering departments, um, and geology departments, and then uh, just took it from there. Um, and why did you pick Brown? Um, Let's see. That's um, 
uh, well, actually, when I was um, when I was an undergraduate at Penn, uh, and you have to go see some advisor, uh, the advisor says, "Oh, you should, you know, you should be applying to MIT for uh, for graduate school. You're a you're a good student. You should think about MIT." And uh, and I remember saying, "I don't want to go to any nerd school. Um, I want to go." I want to go to a nice Ivy League school with a good program so I can go to piano recitals at lunch and I can go to uh, you know lectures on novels um, you know I don't I don't want to go to any school with vector heads you know <laughs> and um, and and of course you know I'm the biggest nerd there is <laughs> I mean I study all the time and um, uh, but that's what I thought. So I didn't. I didn't uh, actually ever apply to MIT. And my my advisor was actually my my high school teacher. He wanted me to apply to MIT, and I kind of said the same thing to him. So um, he was very disappointed. My undergraduate advisor was disappointed. And um, but you know things if things fall out. You know here I am. That advisor so. had the last laugh. <laughs> so. um, can you talk a little bit about that experience of seeing the Voyager images of Jupiter? Ah, uh, Voyager. Yeah, well, I was in a bar <laughs> and um, and they had uh, the images going by of the, the Voyager flyby of Jupiter and they were showing um, the pictures of it and um, and it was it was really the first time any human had seen that in that way. I mean, you could see Jupiter through a telescope, and we actually had some pioneer images of uh, of Jupiter. But you know, what Voyager showed was just completely different. It showed the moons, and uh, and, and I, you know, I was looking at that, and um, and and I, yeah, I thought to myself, you know, you could make a killing. If you, if nobody ever knew anything before, and then you have information that no one else had, and you studied it, you could make a killing. And um, and uh, you know, science has gotten very compartmentalized and very uh, detailed. Where um, you know, to go make an original contribution, uh, you. you uh, well, I mean, it's very common in science to apply a reductionist approach, where you go in, you look at a system, and you break it down, and you look at, and so, as you break it down, you keep looking at smaller and smaller parts of the system to try to um, characterize it, and um, and so, so it seemed to me that you could really, uh, you know, really do things of big scope if you just looked where no one looked before, and um, and. Uh, and I was interested in my interests were very broad. You know, I mean, I I loved space. I loved to hike. You know, I'm one of these people who you know, I look out the window in a car and I'm fascinated. You know, when I'm on an airplane, I always always sit in a window seat. I love to look at the sky and the ground. I mean, I just I just draw um, huge amounts of inspiration out of looking at that. And and it occurred to me that. Uh, you know, if you go and you look someplace no one's ever looked, you always make a discovery. You you never don't make a discovery. You know, I've, and um, and so so it was actually that um, that caused me to want to um, do graduate work in planetary science as opposed to um, you know some of the other fields that I was thinking about. Um, but then when I went to graduate school. Um, well, I was I was interested in that, but I, I somehow um, deviated. I, uh, I I got interested in um, a class of uh, fluid dynamical problems with highly nonlinear viscous fluids, and um, and I, I just uh, you know, I wound up writing a theoretical PhD thesis that didn't have a single data point in it, and. Um, just because I, I, I just was interested in the physics of the problem, but I, I enjoyed it because um, I owned it. 
you know, I just found something that I liked and I figured it out and um, and I um, I enjoyed that. But um, uh, but then I, you know, I mean, I think though, um, really uh, that I'm a natural explorer. I think, and so um, so uh, I when I am. Um, when I finished my graduate work, I kind of always wanted to work for uh, for NASA, and so my fiance at that time, who's my husband now, he was um, he was getting his PhD at the or his uh, his MBA at the Wharton School, and um, let's see, I think I want to say that again, so because I this idea of PhD. Go ahead. Okay, so when I was finishing up um, my um, my PhD, uh, my fiance who's now my husband, was finishing up his MBA at uh, the, the Wharton School at Penn. And he said, give me five cities where you might get a job. And, um, and I gave him five cities, and he got job offers in all five cities. And, um, and, and I, got, uh, I got all the positions I applied for, too, um, somehow. And, um, and he said, "Oh well, you, you know, you've always wanted to work for NASA, so why don't um, why don't we go to Washington and you take this postdoc um, at uh, at the Goddard Space Flight Center?" And um, and they they actually hired me because uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center they had a very strong um, Earth Sciences group, and they were interested in getting into planetary sciences, and so they. Hired me to come in and um, uh, assist them or contribute to that, and um, and they had just won an altimeter to go to Mars that they were uh, a radar altimeter that they were very excited about. And um, but not long after I got to um, to Goddard, uh, the Challenger exploded, and so it. Set the program back, so um, so everything slipped, and um, and when uh, the the mission that this uh, radar altimeter was supposed to be on, when this slipped, uh, the cost of the altimeter absolutely skyrocketed, and um, and so NASA, so on this spacecraft there were a number of instruments they just totally deselected. Some of the instruments and threw them off to uh, to get the cost down. And then for the altimeter, they decided to hold an open competition um, for uh, whoever could come in with the best cheap altimeter. So um, so at that time, all the planets were being mapped with radars. And um, and when I had gotten down to Goddard. Um, it was when Reagan was president, and it was in the Star Wars era, and um, and they were putting a lot of money into space-based laser technology, and so uh, so it just occurred to me that um, well, if you're putting two billion dollars a year into space-based laser technology, there's probably something useful. In it, so um, so I got my uh, security clearance, and I went in and uh, with some other colleagues, all of whom were about my age, and we looked at the uh, the Star Wars laser technologies, and um, and when you talk about uh, classified systems, it's all power, pointing, stability, jitter. And um, and so so what you do is you just take all those specs and you dumb them down until right below the classification level, and um, and so then they've done all the hard part, <laughs> and you can so that you know we and then so when the um, when they had this contest, uh, we proposed a laser system, um, and uh, and. In terms of performance, we blew the radars out of the water, and um, and so um, so my second year out of grad school, uh, we won um, 
a $10 million instrument to go to Mars. And, and, uh, and then ever since then, uh, all the altimeters that have gone to the planets uh, until about two years ago um, had all been lasers, and they've all been ours. So, um, so that, was, that was good. Um, but, uh, and so that, that's what really kind of got things going for us. And, um, and I really, I really got involved in that because, um, you know, I had been doing models, some modeling of the planets, and, and I got frustrated because there wasn't uh, observations available to be able to test my theories. And so eventually you get to the point where you just, you'll go get them yourself, you know, and that's what we did. So. Um, and you spent four or five years at Johns Hopkins? Probably not quite that long. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I actually, I really, um, I enjoyed being at NASA a lot, okay? But when you, you know, when you have a job um, in, you know, a place like NASA, um, or, or any research lab really, um, <clears throat> About the best you can ever do is spend half your time doing your research, and then you spend half your time doing what I'll call company business in a way. And so at NASA, it's monitoring contracts or you know things like that. Um, and uh, and I um, I decided I wanted to teach and work with students. So, um, so I asked uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center um, if I could um, spend some time at Johns Hopkins and start working with some students. And they said, OK, you can do this as long as it's on your own time and it's not part of your official duties. Okay, And um, so I, uh, I did that. Uh, I went there and spent, uh, I taught a course for a semester and, uh, and started work with some students up there. And, and then, um, you know, much as I loved NASA, it, it, I just felt like the half of my time I wanted to spend um, in education. Um, I, just, I just drew so much energy out of um, being with students and working with students and um, talking about what I knew. You know, I mean, I spent my, you have to realize, I spent my whole life reading books and learning about space. And it's, it was just, and, um, you know, with students, you could just talk about that stuff. And they sit there, they, they're interested in it. And, you know, with me, that's, it's, you know, I mean, it's not working. It's just, my hobby, right? And um, and so I, you know, I, in fact, I tell all my students now: if you play your cards right, you'll never have to work. And uh, and so I, I feel like I still ever have ever haven't ever really had a job. And um, and so uh, so then Johns Hopkins offered me a faculty position there, and uh, and I decided uh, to take it. And you know, still maintain an affiliation with NASA, but I actually, I actually gave my job talk at Johns Hopkins when I was eight months pregnant, and, um, and they hired me anyway. <laughs> so so um, go figure. Uh, but I, I left uh, eight months pregnant. I left a uh, permanent civil service job at NASA for an untenured uh, faculty position at Johns Hopkins. And, um, you know, and all these people were saying, aren't you worried about not getting tenure? And, uh, you know, and I, I just said, well, no, <laughs> because uh, if, I don't, if I don't get tenure, I'll do something else. But, um, you know, it, it, when you have kids, you, you um, you know, you still do your best work. You don't do you don't do everything that you used to do. Um, 
you know, you can't make everybody happy and fulfill every re request that people have, but you, you do your best stuff. And I, you know, I thought my best stuff would probably be fine. Um, and, uh, oh, and it worked out okay. Yeah. How did you wind up making the move to MIT? Uh, so, so I, I really liked Johns Hopkins. So I, you know, when I went there, I, um, I realized that um, being at a university was really what I wanted to do. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and I liked my colleagues in the department. And uh, they were extremely supportive. Um, and, um, and then uh, at Johns Hopkins, you, you don't get tenure there until the full professor level. And I was I was an untenured associate professor, so I had I had some time to go, which was good given that I had small kids. Um, but uh, uh, MIT called and uh, you know said, why don't you come and talk to us about a position? And I said, uh, no, <laughs> I said, no, I'm 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 good. Um, and uh, and then. Uh, I went home and I told my husband at dinner, I says, oh, MIT called today. And he says, oh, well, you should go talk to them because I've been in my job for 10 years or whatever it was. And, um, and there's, he, he really liked where he was also, but um, uh, he was at Marriott, which is a very good financial company. But, and, it's, and it's, in fact, one of the top financial companies in the Boston area. So. If you leave and you want to be at a top finance place, you have to go someplace else. And uh, and I said, well, I don't know about this. And and so um, so MIT called me back then, and they said, well, um, you have to come and talk to us because uh, it, we we would bring you here with tenure, and you're not tenured, so you have to come and talk to us. Uh, well, that makes uh, it more appealing. Um, well, it, so um, so I said, well, I'll come and give a talk, but um, but it's not an interview. I I don't want to interview for this position. So so um, so I went and gave a talk, and 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 actually, I don't even think it wasn't a really it wasn't a really good talk by my uh, standards because I I. Kind of didn't want the job, okay? And um, and they, uh, you know, they called me up and they said, "All right, well, we're gonna, we want to go out for letters and we want to make you a tenured offer." And um, and and he and said it was Tom Jordan who was the department head. He says, "And you have to do this because um, uh, then John Hopkins would have to tenure you. <laughs> so um, you have to do this." And uh, and so I, uh, so so I went to talk to my department head at Johns Hopkins, and I says, "Well, MIT is talking about uh, um, tenure," and he he kind of patted me on the head and said, "All right, go back to the lab, and you know just keep working, and you'll be tenured here, you know, in several years." And and um, so uh, so I called MIT back, and I said, "All right." Go out for the letters, and um, and then um, they went out for the the letters, and then Johns Hopkins decided that they uh, they were gonna go out for letters, and they went out for letters at the full professor level because they that's where you get tenured there, and then um, and then MIT raised it up and offered me a full professorship, and um, uh, and uh, and. That was really something because I, uh, it was, uh, I would say, a, an aggressive um, offer, and um, uh, and I was afraid it wasn't going to work out at either place. <laughs> and uh, but um, but I'll tell you what I've uh, I I have really uh, never forgotten the fact that they took a risk when they hired me the way they did. And, um, you know, so I've, I've, you know, I've thought about it at times as uh, we've gone around. And, 
Um, and then, you know, so a number of places, you know, then contacted me and says, oh, we didn't know you were available. And I said, well, I wasn't, you know, I, I, uh, I wasn't. And, um, but I, uh, so it was, it was unplanned, I guess, but, uh, but it turned out nice. <laughs> with MIT, did you have some of that residual feeling that you didn't want to be with, uh, with all the nerds? <laughs> um, well, yes and no. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, I think I, I think I told them one. I said, "Look, the only reason I'm coming here because you offered me tenure." You know? <laughs> and um, uh, but um, you know, when I actually when I took the position at Johns Hopkins, I was thinking, "Okay, is this what I want to do?" Because um, uh, you know, I don't consider myself a person who just bounces um, around. I mean, I don't take a job to get the next job. I take a job with the idea that I'm going to. Um, accomplish what I'm going to accomplish, and um, and so uh, so so actually it kind of went through my mind. Okay, if I wasn't going to come to Johns Hopkins, where would I like to be? And and the only place that I really thought had an attraction for me was MIT because they were ranked um, number one in my field, and I just said, well, they'll never hire me, so I should just do this, and it's a great place, and I should be happy about it. So um, so. Um, yeah, so when I came here, then I was, you know, I had the, you know, the willy scared out of me because I was showing up as a full professor. So people think you're really something, you know? <laughs> and, um, and so, um, so, you know, when I came here, I just says, okay, I just want to be average, okay? I just, I want to show up if I can only be as good as the average professor at MIT, then I'll be extremely successful. And, um, and so that's, you know, that was probably the, the, uh, the, it was probably the thing that kept me going because, um, uh, you know, around this place, you know, if you, if you say you want to be the best, you know, and then you look around, um, it, it can be dispiriting really quickly. So, um, you know, because so many, most, if not all, you know, everybody here was all at the top of their class, and and everybody can't be at the top. So so if if you go in and say you want to be as good as the average person in a really good place, then then it uh, it gives you it's it's a it's a much better I think model for success than coming into a place like this and saying you're going to be the best. Uh, and um, and maybe you can, but uh, but you can be disappointed too. So. so you had you had these expectations of what MIT was going to be like. Can you tell me a little bit about what what you thought when you finally got here? How was it different, or how was it the same as you expected? Oh, it was um, okay. So the the. Um, The thing that, one of the things that was surprising to me was that, um, you know, I had, I had been in good schools. I was at the University of Pennsylvania, I was at Brown, I was at Johns Hopkins, and, and all of these places have really top scholars at them. Um, the thing that was surprising um, about MIT is just that the average was just so high, okay? And um, so, you know, as you walk around the campus, you know, any person that you look at, undergraduate, graduate student, you know, faculty, and I guess I think about it more from the standpoint of just the students that are walking around half asleep with their hair disheveled, um, you know, Every single one of those people is just the most remarkable success story. You know, I mean, to, to wind up at MIT, things have to just go remarkably right, okay? Um, and, um, and so just the, the, the overall quality of everybody, I thought, was a surprise to me. I mean, I knew I would find um, very, very smart people here. 
it's everyone, <laughs> okay, everyone. And uh, I mean, you got to watch. You know, you could be in line for the bank machine, and you know, the person next to you, you know, um, has, you know, just made remarkable, remarkable discoveries. So that, you know, that was something that was surprising. Um, she, the other thing that surprised me, um, and had had I known it and realized it, I probably would have been at MIT long ago, uh, is is just the um, the breadth of uh, the uh, the interests of people here. So, um, you know, so the the classic paradigm of the nerdy person who's uh, who's at MIT. You know, there are definitely people like that, um, but uh, but the uh, the just the talent level of the students. I mean, they're. Um, you know they're athletes, and they're they're good athletes. You know they're um, you know really accomplished musicians and playwrights. Um, and I mean it's it's uh, and and you know students who come to MIT they have to be very very strong in science and mathematics. Uh, but to have the other aspects of uh, their being. Um, so highly developed that they're they're so accomplished in in other areas, to me was just a a big surprise. And so, you know, you come here. I can still go to piano recitals and uh, poetry readings, um, and it's it's just those things from the outside of MIT. They don't get the airplay, uh, but. That community is very, very strong, and so so MIT. It's just how good MIT is at history and literature. Um, it's uh, it's fantastic that uh, that all of this is here. So now, do you think that your your high school advisor was right? Um, boy, you hate to say that anyone in authority who has ever <laughs> told you anything <laughs> was right. Because I know, no, you know nobody that I advise, I think, ever really listens to me that carefully. But um, uh, uh, I can only say I'm, uh, I'm happy I'm here. So when I look at your, your sort of list of um, areas of interest, I, I sort of have the same feeling as what you're talking about with the students, because Traditionally, you know, astronomers are the ones who kind of study space, and geologists study earth science. And you're coming with a much more interdisciplinary kind of background, it seems to me. So wh when you're looking at volcanoes in Iceland, or mapping the surface of Mars, or creating some scientific instruments, is there sort of a thread that unites all of these interests in your mind? Um, well, I'd love to be able to tell you there was a plan. <laughs> um, but um, but uh, I think what it was is that I just, I, I was so interested in so many different things that um, I just wanted to be involved in every part of the process. Okay, I didn't, I didn't want to be in charge of every part of the process, but um, I couldn't bear to analyze data from an instrument that I didn't understand. And so, so actually it, it started at Goddard um, where uh, when, when I got the chance to do this, uh, my first laser instrument, um, they wouldn't let me in the clean room because I, um, I wasn't qualified to be in the clean room. So, so I started Taking all these courses to get all my engineering certifications, and um, just so I could go in the in the clean room and um, shoot. You know, when they were shooting the laser, it's a lot of fun. And um, and um, so I took all these tests and I got all my engineering certifications. 
and um, and then I, I felt like I really understood things. So I, I really wanted to go from the point of um, having this idea of some aspect of science that I, I wanted to solve uh, a question um, to um, deciding what measurement had to be made and what instrumentation was required to make it and designing uh, not the best instrument, but one that could win a proposal, uh, which is something very different, um, and then analyzing the data, uh, and then you know writing the papers uh, to to talk about it. So, um, so actually, I was I was lucky in my career actually that um, well unlucky and lucky. So the first instrument that I won, the spacecraft was lost three days before it got to Mars. And, um, and in the interim, I had written a proposal for this uh, Department of Defense mission um, where they wanted to test Star Wars sensors. And they couldn't test them in Earth orbit because of a treaty. Um, so they decided to send the spacecraft to the moon. And um, I wrote a proposal to be on the science team. And they had a laser instrument on it. And, um, and so you know, people said, what do you want to be on this crummy Department of Defense mission for when you got this fantastic instrument going to Mars? And, and I just went, because it's going to the moon, you know? I mean, you don't know. So then the spacecraft with the Mars instrument got lost. And, um, and so, uh, so we had this um, moon mission. And as soon as they got the first photon back from the moon to the spacecraft, the defense objective was finished. And, um, and the mission was, uh, was called Clementine. It was being run by uh, um, the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. And so um, the leader of the mission, his name was uh, Colonel Pedro Rustan. And he actually, he, he escaped from Cuba, swam across Guantanamo Bay to a US ship, defected, got a PhD in lightning, and joined the Air Force. And, uh, and he decided he wanted to map the whole moon. And, um, and so after they, for the instrument that I was working on, the laser system, as soon as he got the photons back, he came up to me and he says, OK, this is your instrument. Come with me. Here's the computer where you send commands. You can, uh, can you program? <laughs> and I says, a little. And he says, OK. You can program this instrument to do whatever you want, but just don't deal with any of these other files because you might crash the spacecraft into the moon or something. So I had, you know, was given this uh, instrument to w work with, and um, you know, I had a, it had to be programmed uh, significantly to operate scientifically, and uh, and so I learned how to do all this stuff um, just on the fly, really, and. Um, and it was great because you know then I then I really did understand uh, the whole process and that was uh, that was very important to me. So um, and I feel I feel like uh, I've written better papers because I've understood the data, um, but I've also felt like it's really helped me design other instruments. Um, you know I always I always say when you design when you're going into a proposal competition. Um, yeah, I always like to count up how many miracles do you need? So how many how many big technological hurdles do you have to get over? And and so you figure out how many there are, how many there can be to get selected, and then you make sure you only have that many or less. And um, and so um, so by being a little bit broad, it I think it's helped actually. So so despite the fact that you left NASA. You have continued to do work there over the years. Can you talk a little bit about the projects that you've worked on? Well, my, um, you know, unlike uh, many research programs of um, professors at universities, um, uh, most of the research that I do is with big teams of people. So I. I really depend um, very heavily on the contributions of uh, 
of a whole lot of people. So um, I've, I'm probably um, most recognized for, uh, for the instrument investigations. Um, so, um, so the first one that actually came to pass was um, the Clementine mission, um, which we did the first global topography map of the moon and, uh, and did a, a very good gravity model of the near side and a not so good gravity model of the far side because if you don't, because we never see the far side of the moon from Earth, um, the, uh, you actually have to be in view of Earth to measure gravity at a planet. So, um, so you, can, you can make some inferences about what's going on in the back from the way the spacecraft gets bounced around on the front. And, um, and so we were able to make use of that. But we did the first uh, map of the crustal thickness of the moon that was uh, global in extent, and which gave some idea of how much of the moon had melted early in its history. And, um, and that's, uh, actually it was that work that, uh, that MIT hired me for, so. Um, and uh, then um, at Mars, uh, well, that was the second time's the charm. The, uh, so we sent an altimeter to Mars to, um, to measure the topography of that planet, and, and that was an instrument that we designed ourselves. So the, the first one was lost, um, and, um, and then, um, uh, well, we, uh, we wanted to try to get it back. And of course, space missions are, they're very expensive. And, um, and um, when you want to do a space mission, there's a lot more to it than just writing a proposal. So, um, so actually when the mission was lost, uh, I actually spent a lot of time down on Capitol Hill trying to um, get funding uh, put back in the budget to um, to refly that mission, which then happened. So um, so we did that. So we uh, we measured the topography of Mars um, better than we know the topography of Earth. So that was uh, that was a a nice thing, and um, and uh, we also measured the gravity of the planet um, very well. Um, and Mars rotates nicely, so you can see the whole thing. So we measured the full planetary gravity field and, um, and so did initial models of the interior structure of Mars. Um, we, measured, uh, we measured the topography so accurately uh, that on Mars, well, Mars, is, Mars has an atmosphere, has a carbon dioxide uh, atmosphere, and, um, and its orbit is more elliptical than an Earth's orbit is, and it's tilted on its axis about the same amount as Earth. So it actually goes through seasons like the Earth goes through. And, um, and because the atmosphere is very thin, the seasons are, um, are actually more dramatic in terms of how they change on the planet. So, uh, so it actually snows dry ice on Mars in the winter hemisphere. And, um, and we were able to measure how deep the snow got from, uh, from orbit. And um, with a satellite uh, before that measurement was made on Earth. <laughs> so we, we published that paper um, in Science. Um, before the same measurement was made on Earth, I was uh, I was pretty excited about that. And um, and actually, I thought I thought the um, I thought the Earth Science community that we were that we were going to get a lot of uh, pushback from them, um, uh, and, and that I was going to be afraid to talk in front of <laughs> my Earth Science colleagues about this sort of stuff. But uh, actually, they. Um, they just says, "Oh no, this is great. We, you know, we gotta play this up because 
this is embarrassing that <laughs> you're over uh, making all these measurements at Mars and we can't, you know, we, and it, it was more of, it wasn't that you could, you couldn't do it on Earth, it was just that the funding was available to go do these missions on Mars and it wasn't um, for the Earth. There, there was, when you make certain le measurements for Earth, there's political things involved um, with it. So, um, so uh, I says, well, maybe I'll do Earth someday. Uh, but I, I uh, deviated from that. I got um, won an altimeter on an asteroid mission. So, um, so we, uh, it was called the Near Earth Asteroid Rendezvous mission, which was uh, 433 Eros, which is one largest near Earth asteroids, and um, the spacecraft orbited there, so keeping a spacecraft in orbit around a big potato, 30, 30 kilometers uh, wide, um, is a very challenging thing, actually, and that was, that was fun, because that was, that was a hard, it was a hard project to figure out how to keep a spacecraft in orbit. So we measured the, the shape um, of the asteroid and also measured the gravity field, so we were, um, able to get at the uh, what the interior of the asteroid was like and how much it was broken apart. So that was um, th yeah, that was the f first real study like that that had been done um, of an asteroid. And you discovered your own asteroid. I didn't discover it. <clears throat> it was discovered for me. So so if you discover uh, people who discover asteroids get to name them after whoever they want. So I I am. Um, extremely honored. Uh, my asteroid was discovered by uh, Jeet and Carolyn Shoemaker, who also discovered the comets that hit Jupiter. So uh, comet Shoemaker-Levy, that all the pieces broke up and it hit Jupiter. So Jean, um, Jean was uh, the father of planetary geology. He, um, he was the world's expert on impact basins on the Earth. He did all the initial mapping of lunar craters on the moon. He trained the Apollo astronauts. And he had been on the Clementine mission, um, where I came on as like the junior, sub-junior uh, person. They always pick a couple of junior people to come on and do all the work. Um, and um, and uh, in recognition of the work that I did in terms of making discoveries at the moon, Jean and Carolyn, um, one of the, they were, they, I talked to, Car Carolyn told me about this because the asteroid was approved um, with my name after Jean had died. And, and she says, well, we were waiting for the perfect asteroid. And, um, and so my asteroid is a Mars crosser. It crosses the orbit of Mars. And, um, and they picked that one for me because it might hit Mars someday and make, make a crater. Um, not in our lifetimes, of course, but um, but uh, so to have uh, to have Gene Shoemaker um, name an asteroid after me that that was that was actually one of the biggest honors that I think uh, I've had because um, uh, I have have a great deal of uh, professional respect for Gene and um, and for him to have thought that I had done some good work was uh, really meant a lot to me. So, um, so, uh, so that's that's about what I've done from asteroids so far. Um, we we have um, we're sending a, a mission to Mercury um, called Messenger, and uh, we haven't been to Mercury for decades and. And Mercury is not that far away, actually, um, and uh, and the reason is it's close to the sun, so it's first of all it's hot and it's hard to get into orbit. So, um, so Messenger, the Messenger mission um, was launched, and and it's ta it takes a long time to get to Mercury because what has to happen if you think about the sun, if you're launching a spacecraft. Uh, you, the way you get into orbit around the sp a planet is you, you fly near it and then you slow down the spacecraft enough 
so that the planet's gravity field captures it. Okay, so um, so the problem with going to Mercury is because it's close to the sun. As as you come in and go close to the sun, you speed up. So it's a little bit like a penny in a wishing well. As it as it spirals in, it speeds up. And so when you send a spacecraft to Mercury, it has to be almost all fuel. And um, and so and then you can still barely get into orbit. And so what you have to do to get into orbit is fly by everything to sl use planetary gravity, gravity assist to slow you down. So the spacecraft flew by, Mercu flew by Mercury three times and flew by Venus twice. And every time it flew by, it did it in a way that it would slow the spacecraft down. So, so we actually have um, gotten data from three flybys of Mercury. And, and I'm pleased to say we've written several really uh, substantial papers um, with Mercury. And we had only actually imaged 40% of the surface of Mercury. So even flyby information caused us to learn a lot. But we've, because we've, uh, you know, we've, we've learned that the crust on one side of Mercury um, uh, is substantially thicker than the crust on the other side. And I was, that's a pretty good discovery for having not even gotten into orbit yet. So, um, so next year we get into orbit and there will be uh, a lot more to come in that regard, I think. So, but Mercury, that was, that was the hardest um, instrument we've ever designed. And the reason for that is because you know, Mercury so close to the sun, you just fry. It's just, it's hot. Electronics don't like to be hot. And so with the spacecraft, there's a sunscreen on it that's made of like the same material that firefighters wear. So that keeps the sun off. But where you burn is that the sun shines on the surface of Mercury. So it's the infrared radiation coming off of Mercury. And, and so the spacecraft is in a big elliptical orbit. And when it comes into Mercury, everything heats way up. And then it goes back out into the far part of the orbit from Mercury. And then it just radiates to space and it gets cold. So, so over the course of the mission, you go through all these temperature swings. And you have to, you need really, really good engineering to prevent like leads on resistors from breaking due to thermal stresses. It, that was a really hard, and the, the mirrors distort, so we didn't use a mirror. Um, uh, so I, I enjoyed that, because that was a tough problem. And, um, and so uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of planetary missions, unfortunately, don't get where they're going. Um, because they um, they get lost for you know because it's hard um, and um, and so I guess I'm fortunate because uh, I get as much satisfaction from the process of um, designing an experiment and, and building it and flying it and making observations on how it's behaving and like what we call the housekeeping data, um, uh, how it's performing, um, as I do from doing the science. And that's, that's probably a good thing. So, um, so actually when I went to Congress and was talking to them about uh, reflying the mission to Mars, uh, I said, you know, when you, when you buy a mission to Mars, you're not buying a pile of parts. You know, you're, you're buying um, people that you teach how to do something extremely hard to do. And, um, and, uh, and so that's, that's a big part of, um, of what we have to do in the group to, to be able to do our science is just the, the process of going through all these technical steps to, to get to the point where, um, where we can do the science. You know, once I start getting data, 
the papers almost write themselves, <laughs> I think. Uh, um, and right now, um, let's see, I've, I've got a couple uh, going on right now. So um, aside from Mercury, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, I'm um, leading the gravity field team there, and uh, we were able to measure the mass of uh, the south polar cap of Mars, which turned out to be, that was interesting, it turned out to be the largest volume of surface water in the solar system, water ice, largest reservoir, uh, outside of Earth. So that was a nice little discovery that came out of uh, that mission. And, um, and, uh, and now we're mapping the moon. Um, topographically um, and um, and there we'll make a, a topographic map it's already better than the Mars map that we had made so this is the second planet that we've now measured better than Earth and um, and we're writing papers uh, on that so um, so those will be big discoveries and then we have a, a mission that's going to an asteroid uh, to two asteroids um, Vest and Ceres in the asteroid belt um, so, so there's more to come, I think, even. And um, y you're one of the first women to head a major space exploration. And I, yeah. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about what it's like being a woman in this field. Yeah, sure. Um, well, so, um, you know, I have to say that uh, it's it's usually not a problem um, because uh, well I'm oblivious to to uh, to everything um, and in fact um, when I was the first mission I was on Mar the Mars Global Surveyor mission and I got a phone call from a reporter and uh, and the reporter said there's 87 investigators on this mission and you're the only woman and I said no way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so after I hung up, I, I went and I looked at the list and I went, oh my God, I'm the only woman. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, that must be why I get asked to give all these talks. <laughs> and, um, and win some awards. And, um, so, uh, um, yeah, so, um, so I, I didn't, I, I hadn't actually noticed, okay, um, uh, but uh, but I, I do say that you know early earlier in my career I um, overtly overtly published with my initials, okay, because I said if I publish papers and it says Maria, no one's going to read the paper, right? So um, and and then uh, some of my male colleagues were were saying, okay, Maria. You know, this is the wrong attitude. You got to celebrate this, not hide it. Um, people are going to read your papers because you wrote them. Now that you don't have to worry about that. And so I, I eventually switched over and I use my my full name now. But I remember the first time I ever gave a talk um, in the Soviet Union. So I went to the Soviet Union to to, uh, to a workshop there in a symposium and I was I was up on the stage and I was giving this talk and um, and you know, can, you know can you tell when people are staring at you you know um, you know it was like oh my god is my slip showing or what's going on and I you know I gave my talk and I you know I just had this feeling like people were staring through me and I uh, you know I finished and then the coffee break occurred and and uh, and all these people coming up to me and says you're a woman. <laughs> we, we've been reading your papers for years, and, and uh, we didn't realize you were a woman. <laughs> and uh, so I went, oh, OK. Um, so, uh, so I would say m most of the time, um, it, uh, it really uh, doesn't matter uh, too much. Uh, but there, you know, there, there, 
certainly have been um, cases where uh, you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been in conversations, like at conferences, where I'd be talking to somebody, and, and I couldn't tell this person's blowing me off, you know, and then he notices my badge and the name, and, and then it, the conversation changes somewhat. But, um, but, uh, you know, I think it's. Uh, it's important to get out and and um, demonstrate that anybody can do this. I mean, uh, you know, the nice, actually, the nice thing about uh, science really is um, it doesn't matter how you dress or what you look like. Um, ultimately, it matters if you do good work, and um, and so uh, you know. Ultimately, if you can get over the hump, uh, where um, you know people will read your work and take it seriously on the basis of the fact that it's good work. So, and y you have been become um, quite a role model for women in science. I is that something that's important to you? Well, I'll. I'll um, she. It. It didn't start. Out that way, um, you know. In fact, uh, for years and years and years, um, I would never be on any committee having to do with women. I wouldn't do women's mentoring. Um, you know, I've said, "Don't put me on a committee." Uh, uh, you know, a women's whatever committee. Um, because I, I felt like the best way to promote women in science was to be a good scientist, okay? Not to talk about it. Um, but um, but I, I came around um, on that question. Um, when I became department head at MIT, um, I guess they had done a survey um, in the department of, uh, with our women students of how many of you would like to become a professor at a place like MIT, okay? And, um, and I mean, we, we had many tens of women graduate students in the department, and only one said that she would like to be a professor at a place like MIT. And she's, she's now a professor at Yale, so. So that, that worked out great. Um, so I, I invited the women graduate students for dinner. We had a dinner. And uh, you know I let them have it. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to be a professor? Get with, you know, how, could, how could you not want the kind of life that I have? Look, I, I, you know, I write papers. I go to conferences. You know, I travel around the world. You know, I have a wonderful husband. I have two beautiful children. Tell me what's wrong with this life that you don't want this life like this. You, 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 you know, we have to uh, solve this education problem for women. And um, and I, it it really got me energized uh, on this topic. And um, and um, and I'm pretty thoughtful before I go in and. Do something um, because I there's only so many things you can do, and, and I use most of the hours in a day, so so there aren't a lot of leftover hours. So so when I go about doing something, I want to work on something where I can make an impact, and uh, and I decided that this question of women in science technology, mathematics was an area where, where I could really make some headway. So, uh, so I actually now devote a fair amount of my time to, to this topic. So I, I lecture about it, I talk about it, and virtually every time I go anywhere for a visit, I always ask to, um, to talk to students, but in particular 
women students, and now um, I'm getting more interested in minority students because that's such a big problem, and it's it's difficult to make headway on. But I've uh, um, I'm I'm devoting a fair amount of energy to it because I think we can make some headway in this problem. So much of what you've done has had sort of a um, a public service aspect to it. Um, and I, I wonder if doing research that's in the public interest is something that's um, overtly important to you, or is it sort of a byproduct of what are your natural interests anyway? Um, well, part of it is um, that I'm just so excited about what I do um, that I, I can't imagine that everybody else wouldn't be at least somewhat excited by it, maybe not quite as much as me, but, uh, but I consider what I do for my research to be a, a great privilege, okay? Um, you know, I mean, I use uh, taxpayer money for the most part, um, uh, to uh, to explore the solar system, and I believe that the people who foot the bill deserve to um, to know what's going on, and uh, and I'll, I have a I have a personal goal that I want to reach people in way who have never been reached before um, on this topic and um, and I want the I want the textbooks to be fixed so when a student opens an astronomy textbook it talks about what's really out there and without the uncertainty and uh, and I I consider this to be um, an essential part of what I do. So. Um, is that part of the reason you're such a supporter of continued space exploration? Um, I think that that's a that's a part of the reason. Um, another part of the reason um, that I'm a supporter of, uh, of continued space exploration is, um, is that I, I understand um, the inspiration factor both for kids and for society, okay? Um, I, was on, um, I was on the presidential commission that studied the Moon Mars Initiative, and part of what we had to do was just go around the country and talk to people. And um, and I can't even begin to tell you how many people I talked to who decided to become scientists or engineers because of the Apollo landings on the Moon. And and these are not people who became space scientists. They became biologists or telecom engineers or something like that. But they did it uh, initially because they were interested in space. And, um, and, and I also think that for society in general, um, we have to be pushing at the frontiers of knowledge all the time. Um, uh, or else we're not going to progress as a society, and and I think I think space exploration is one way of doing that. I think there are other ways of doing that as well, and and I support those activities also. Um, you, so you you're involved now in some administrative aspects of MIT, and you've now been here for twenty years. If, Fifteen. Okay. Fifteen. Okay. Yeah. Um, what is it that keeps you at MIT? How does how does MIT help or hinder your work? 
Um, okay, I have to I have to get some clarity on the question here okay. because uh, what what is it that keeps I'm trying me to in administration at MIT or at MIT just, just in general? Well, oh. let's talk just <clears throat> at MIT. What is it about MIT that makes it a good fit for you? Okay, so what what is it that uh, makes MIT a good fit for me? Um, well, part of it is that um, that the place is um, it's extremely interdisciplinary, and so uh, I can uh, be a scientist and I can do my science. Um, but I'm also interested in developing technology to do science. And, um, and in a lot of places, that stuff doesn't count. The, the science part counts. Um, but I think one of the reasons MIT was interested in me because there was the other part. Um, and, um, and in this place where we are, I think it's, it's easier to work between disciplines than anywhere else I know. And if you have a good idea here, um, it's very easy to get people interested in it uh, as long as it's really hard and um, uh, and it's it's uh, and it's worthwhile doing, and the the fact that it's just possible um, to create something um, that that didn't exist before. There there aren't there aren't institutional barriers to going off in very very new directions. Um, in fact, it's encouraged and celebrated. So. I, I think that's what the real attraction is. That that does seem to be a consistent theme with people that 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 MIT is much more open than many other fine institutions of higher learning. Yeah, it's um it's the it's interesting that there aren't um I don't really have problems with turf battles here um because uh because great problems attract people from a lot of directions, and um, and you know, as long as you bring something to the problem, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's uh, there's there's plenty of credit uh, to go along um, with it, and and so I just there just there just haven't been any impediments to um, to going off in new directions and doing new things. Um, do you enjoy being a department head? Do I enjoy being a department head? Uh, it depends what day <laughs> you ask That's that a question. Fair <laughs> um, Are there okay. things that you're able to do as okay. a department head that you couldn't do otherwise? Okay. Um, so, uh, so in the work that. Uh, any given individual does. Uh, there's the work that you do, and and there are things that you can enable and help happen. Um, so uh, so for example, um, you know one of one of my personal career goals is to develop young scientists. So when I um, work with young scientists and they go out and they become successful scientists, I personally get a great deal of satisfaction out of that. Um, and, um, and I feel like, uh, I feel like education really occurs at all levels. It doesn't occur just at the professor teaches student, but I also think that developing the careers of uh, Say graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and junior faculty 
are also things that um, that are very important for um, the education system and and for the fields, and and so so as a department head, I can uh, contribute towards the the developing of those uh, careers, not necessarily by something that I do myself, but just you know helping arrange a situation that puts a person in a place where they're able to move and succeed on their own. And, um, and so, uh, so I, take a, I take a great deal of, uh, of satisfaction out of that. And that goes down to uh, you know, even developing curricula in the department for instruction and um, uh, who we accept and we don't accept. I mean, they're, they're just all those things that, uh, that go into planning. Um, and then um, also even in, even in areas where we hire. So if I say we're going to hire in this field, and of course I, I actually I execute the wishes of the faculty. So everything, everything uh, is very grassroots. So, so all of us at a faculty, we decide what we want to do. And then I go and figure out how to do it. And, um, and it's very interesting. So when, for example, when we go in and we say we're going to hire in this field, then you're going to see other schools hiring in these fields. And, uh, and when, when we go out of a field, you wouldn't believe the complaints I hear from people in that field. <laughs> um, so uh, so there's, there's really the ability to really influence the direction of science in a different way uh, other than the individual papers uh, that you write. And, um, and that's something that I derive satisfaction from. What, what do you think are the, the most important strengths of your department? The, the strengths of my department. Um, the, I think the, well, the, the greatest strength is just the, the, uh, the intellectual power of my colleagues and our students. Okay, that, uh, that's, uh, that's number one. But I, I think that um, the, uh, the, the interdisciplinary and collaborative nature of the department. So my department covers topics which range from the depths of the earth to um, the surface of the earth, mountain building, uh, processes, floods, the oceans, the atmosphere, outer space, and even other solar systems. And, and so we just cover a huge amount of intellectual ground. And, um, and, and, uh, and we, we form interesting collaborations. Uh, and actually, I think because of the fact that we're so broad, you know, we're not all tripping each, over each other trying to s sequence the same gene or something. We're, we're, we're extremely broad, and so it, it has a tendency to bring people together when problems arise, uh, that, that we do these broad collaborations. So we were, we were, we've really been doing interdisciplinary science uh, for much, much longer than it's been fashionable to do that in science. And, and, um, and the fact that we proceed and and because our, uh, everybody in our department is so quantitatively strong in basic sciences um, in compared to uh, some earth sciences where people are, uh, are more qualitative, um, we, can, we can bring together many aspects of the problem from the physics, the biology, the geology, you know, uh, everything. Is that, is that part of what makes MIT unique, or maybe I should just ask you, what do you think makes MIT unique? Oh, what makes MIT unique? Um, uh, well, I think it's, um, it's the thought that nothing's impossible here, um, that, uh, that that 
not only is it possible to address the most uh, difficult questions, uh, but that we're responsible for, for doing it. Um, uh, this idea of, uh, on which the basis of MIT was founded, of service to the nation, that, uh, that those who are in a position to help ought to help, um, really drives us to problem solving of you know, the most difficult problems. And you know, when you're solving problems that are that difficult, uh, you need to get help. <laughs> So, so, so we naturally go to gravitate to um, to bring people together uh, to address those things, and um, and I think uh, I I think it's just remarkable the esprit de corps when uh, you know the president goes around and talks to a lot of people, and a lot of people say energy, and then the president says energy, and everybody <laughs> forges after. Uh, energy. Um, it's uh, it's a beautiful thing, um, and it's it's so great to be a part of it, um, where uh, where the pace of progress is uh, is as fast as it is. I mean, this place is it's always running on fast forward, um, and uh, and you leave and you go anywhere else and. Um, and it's almost like it's running in slow motion, you know. And then you come back and you realize that the environment that you're you're in, and this this seems normal <laughs> um, until you go someplace else. It does. To me, it has a completely different feel than other schools that I've been involved in, um, in a similar way. It's a, it's a cool place. <laughs> yes. Um, I haven't asked, you know, all of the questions here, but it's it's just about five o'clock. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like okay. to know is, what things have we not talked about that you think are important to talk oh, about? Well, we haven't talked about Grail. <coughs> so let's talk okay, about we Grail. Should, we <laughs> probably should have talked about Grail. So, um, okay. So, um, so I'm uh, I'm the principal investigator of a. Uh, mission called GRAIL, which stands for Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory. And we're going to be sending two spacecraft to the moon, and they're going to enter into lunar orbit. And, um, and the spacecraft aren't that big. They're about the size of a dishwasher, OK? Um, and, um, and they're going to send radio signals to each other, and um, we're going to measure how the two spacecraft move uh, t towards and away from each other because of the way that they're perturbed by the gravity field of the moon. So, um, so I tell people we're essentially measuring the distance between two points. And, and so you can, you can be at the cutting edge for measuring the distance um, between two points. Um, but it's the fact that you can do it to a couple of microns when it's in lunar orbit that actually uh, makes it rocket science, um, and um, and the opportunity arose to do this to propose a mission, and um, and when when you propose them, it's a it's a big deal, and it's it's a lot of people, um, you know, it's more than a hundred people working on the mission, and. Um, and when you do that, um, so it's first. First of all, do you want to do something like this? Do you want to do you want to write a proposal that's going to take you six months to write? Do you want to drop everything and write a proposal for six months? And then if you win, you get to spend six months writing another proposal. Um, and um, and so uh, so so actually doing the gravity field of the moon. Um, I have this mental list of things that I'd like to do in my career. Um, and this had been one of the things that had been on the list. But technologically, politically, you know, the time is never right. But, but I'd actually been 
thinking about it for a long time. So, um, so when the Chinese decided they were going to go to the moon and they were going to launch um, two people into orbit, I said, it's time. It's, it's time. We're going to do this now. And, um, and the, the key to, um, to winning a proposal like this is getting the right team together and getting things to click. That's, you know, there, there's lots of smart people out there, you know, but the difference between winning and losing is getting the right group of people together and, and getting a chemistry together so that you figure out how to write the correct proposal that needs to be written. And, um, and so I've been, you know, but all these uh, people that I've been working with all through my career, you know, I just started calling people, and uh, and everybody was excited. So uh, so we got we got a great group of people together, and you know, since you work all the time, you like to be around <laughs> people that you can get along with because. Um, because this is all about managing resources, um, managing risk, which means managing resources. And so we, we got the right people together. And, and actually what, what excites me about the mission is how thrilled the engineers are about the science that's going on and how interested the scientists are about how the engineering is being done. And, um, and, you know, the engineers that I have, they, they will do anything to do a little bit better in the, the measurement. And, uh, and I sometimes have to hold them back so that we stay within our budget. Um, but uh, we also have, um, I also said that if, if, I, uh, if I ever got the opportunity to do this, that I was really going to take the outreach and education part to an entirely new level that's never never been done before. So I, um, when I won, I called Sally Ride, um, America's first woman in space. And Sally and I had been working together for years. Sally devotes her career to um, education with, with an emphasis on uh, girls in science and technology and math. And, um, and I asked her to run uh, the education program. And so what we came up with is that this is going to be the first mission that has cameras on the spacecraft that have no scientific purpose. The cameras are entirely for outreach and education. And, um, and uh, they're going to be programmed by students, and um, it's going to be targeted at middle schools. And um, so middle school students will get to propose where on the moon we're going to take pictures. And there's never going to be conflicts with scientific observations because there are no scientific observations from it. So the, the scientific observation is just the two spacecraft sending radio signals to each other, which they do constantly. And, and so the images um, can just be a complete student experiment. It's the first time it's ever been done. And, um, and I'm convinced the only way I was able to do it because I had Sally <laughs> on the mission. Otherwise, I, I, I doubt that would have uh, flown in the review process. Um, but of course, we, we wrote a really careful proposal. But, uh, but, but having, having Sally's creative intensity and vision on this. Uh, you know, we sat down and we said, well, let's try, you know. And, um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled uh, about the opportunity. And, you know, I was initially told by a lot of people that you can't possibly win this proposal because no one understands gravity. So it'll never get through uh, review. Um, and I said, well, just watch. So it was, um, it was the highest rated science proposal in, um, in the group of 30 proposals that they received for missions. And, um, 
and we're not there yet. I mean, there's still a whole lot um, that can go wrong. Uh, but today, knock on wood, uh, we're on track. Uh, you know, we're we're within our budget and um, and we're within our schedule. And um, so, uh, and it's uh, it's the first it's MIT's first space mission. So, um, uh, which uh, the pressure's on. I I hope I don't mess it up. But uh, but uh, but I have I have the right group of people working with me and. We've involved um, we've involved a lot of uh, junior scientists on the team so that they can get experience and uh, and that's something that I'm also really excited about so that that those people will then be able to go on and write their own proposals for to do things like this in the future. And of course, I have to ask, what else is on your list of things you want to do? <laughs> um, what else is on my list? Well, um, I, I'm actually now um, spending a little bit of time thinking about uh, the outer solar system. And um, there I have the opposite problem of Mercury. Mercury is very hot, and the outer solar system is very cold. So, so I'm, uh, I'm thinking about that. Um, I'm also giving a fair amount of thought to uh, optical communications, so to sending data with uh, lasers as opposed to radio systems, and um, and um, and in, in fact, we've done we've done several technology demonstrations. So the the group that I work with, we hold the record for the longest distance a laser beam's ever been fired, uh, and then one way and two ways. So. Um, so, uh, so working on um, uh, communicating optically, uh, which is a uh, an important technological uh, thing, um, is something I'm also thinking about, um, uh, and, and I'm also I'm thinking about weather on other planets and uh, ways that I can measure that. And uh, very precisely, so so I got a, I've got a few things in mind, a few things left to do. Yeah.